Good morning, everybody. Take your Bible. this time. How's that? There we go. Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4. The, the false prophet is going to cause everyone to make an image to the beast. This image in Revelation 13 is going to have the ability to do something that no image, no statue, no idol has ever had the ability to do. Does anybody know what that is? Speak, okay? It's going to have the ability to speak. Now, uh, computers right now speak, all right? They talk. But the ones that are talking to you right now, you know, like if you call the help center, whatever product hotline you're going to call, that's a computerized system. They listen to your voice, and those computers are, have been pre-programmed to understand certain parts of your speech. And those computers then are pre-programmed to respond in a limited number of ways. This has been going on since, uh, I've mentioned this before, but back in the, my Commodore computer days, back in the 80s, there was a, a speech synthesizer for the Commodore where you could type in words and it would try to pronounce them. You could type in whole sentences and it would try to pronounce them. Um, but th that system and the ones that we're dealing with now, and we're in a transition stage, but the ones that we're dealing with now, they still operate on pre-programmed responses. In other words, the computer does not speak outside of what it's been told to speak. All right? Revelation 13, that image is different. It's not just speaking what it's been told to speak. It speaks what it wants to speak. The word want and desire and intention... Those are all words that apply to human beings that do not apply to computers right now. I cannot say of anything that my computer does, and I, I've got one up here, I've got one everywhere, everywhere I turn around there's a computer right here, okay? And all of them, I've never, I've never seen my phone, my tablet, my computer, my car do anything outside of its programming intentionally. I've never seen it do that. I've never seen my computer, when I walk in, let's say I walk into my desk uh, in the morning, my computer automatically wakes up and says, uh, good morning, Pastor Mike. Um, I noted that um, you were thinking about some ideas last night and I brought up your Bible program and your PowerPoint slides and I've already configured your PowerPoint with the proper scriptures to have your sermon ready Sunday. They don't do that for me. That, that would require intention. And my computer does not have intention yet. It does not have a will of its own. It does not have its own desires. But that is changing. 
they've uh, been watching advertisements for artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence, I'll just tell you what that is. That is transforming computers from what they are right now, which are, they call them smart devices. They're not. They're not smart. They're dumb. They only do what we tell them to do. We're the master right now. But artificial intelligence systems are increasing in their ability to go beyond what they're programmed to do, what they're programmed to say, and so on, so that they have intentions. This beast in Revelation, in fact, let's turn there. I had you do it to Deuteronomy 4. We'll go back to that in a minute. But Revelation 13, this, this image, this lifeless, dead image has the ability to, um, let's see here. Okay, verse 14 is where we'll pick it up. And again, this goes back to 2 Corinthians, casting down imaginations. Cast, and we're going to try to close that out today. Casting down, I'm going to show you in the Bible what that looks like. What casting down imaginations looks like, alright? Um, in Revelation 13, 14. The false prophet deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. The image is the image comes from the imagination. Um, I mean, I'm not asking you to confess some great sin, but who in here has seen the movie I Robot? Okay. Isaac Asimov was a science fiction writer. 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, I don't know how long he lived, but he, he wrote a series of short stories and put them in a book called iRobot. And it was about robots and computers having the ability to think on their own. And they made a movie about it. And this, basically the world's going to be taken over. In this movie, the world's going to be taken over by an artificial intelligence system. It's going to be its god or goddess in this particular movie. But... Um, let's see here. The image, the science fiction people dreamed up what it would be like. They imagined different scenarios of what it would be like if a computer or a robot or a computer system began to think on its own, began to um, respond on its own, began to do what it wanted to do. There is a movie that Robin Williams is in called Bicentennial Man. It's sort of based upon the same idea that a robot becomes self-aware and he is asking for rights. He's asking, he wants to marry, he wants to, um, at the end of the movie, he wants to have the ability to die. That's what he wants. And that's the end of the movie. He gets this ability to die, and he, and he dies. He, but it's his intention, his will, his desire. And the image of the beast comes out of the wicked intentions and the imaginations of mankind. And if man doesn't cast these things down, then these imaginations of man are going to exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. They're going to they're gonna say, I am like the Most High. I am God. That's what this happens. So verse um, 15, And he had power to give life unto the, be the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, where does a computer get the idea that it wants to be worshipped. Where did it get that idea from? Is that in any of the Microsoft programming? That it wants to be worshipped. It got that idea from man. Because man wants to be worshipped. Man wants to be adored. Man, every... Baseball star, movie star, rock star, music star, politician, doesn't matter what it is. Most 
of their ambition is they want everybody reaching out to them, bowing to them, giving them reverence, giving them the honor, giving them the money so they can go buy cocaine or whatever it is. But that's, that's what's in their mind. That's what's in their heart. They want that. A lot of them get it and they live their life and they find out that doesn't bring happiness to them, so they end up just wasting their life. Drugs, alcohol, you name it, blow their own brains out or whatever. Robin Williams, one of those guys, could not, he was, he was the, the, the funniest man I've ever seen, watched, whatever. Hilarious. The most unhappy man in the world. So he hangs himself, because that's how happy he is. But anyway, back, back to this. This image of the beast got this idea of wanting to be worshipped from the men and the people who imagined this. This beast, this God, is created by the hands of man. In the Bible, man, God creates man. In this scenario, man is going to create God. Man's going to give this image the ability to do things that man only wishes it could do. And this, and this beast is going to cause people to be killed. That is intention. That is a purpose. That is a desire that right now, every Virgin Mary statue in Festus and Crystal City combined, none of them have, an, have a desire to want to be out of the yard that they're in or out of the church there, or whatever. They don't have any intention. They're dead. They don't have any desire. This one has intention. And it came out of the imagination of mankind. That's where it came from. So anyway, back to Deuteronomy 4. God is warning us to be careful about what's in our imagination. Deuteronomy 4.14 The Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments. I've explained the word statute before, but let me just run it down again. Uh, the English language comes from a combination of languages all over the world. Latin, Greek, you name it. Um, in Latin, there is a, a root of a word in Latin. It's S-T-A or S-T-E, or there's variants of it. But that S-T-A root basically means it doesn't move, it, it is, it's fastened and does not budge, it's not altered, it's not going away. So when you stop at a stop sign, S-T-O, that means you're to become in a fixed place. This stage is where everything is fixed. A staging area for any kind of operation is a fixed place. It does not move. Um, statutes had the STA root in it, which means these are laws that do not bend. Uh, remember that. Remember that. Statutes are written in stone. They're not altered. They do not bow and bend to the will of man. That's what statutes are. God gave us a fixed, statutory, stable, static, unmovable, unchangeable word. He gave that to us. Thou shalt not commit adultery is universal. It, wasn't just, it didn't mean something in Moses' day, now it means something else today. It doesn't work that way. These rules were not written on Play-Doh that we can just make them out of, or make out of them whatever we want. We can just fashion Play-Doh. We can take Play-Doh, we can try to make little fat people, you know how we used to make Play-Doh, right? Roll up a ball, that's the guy's chest, that's my chest. Put little Play-Doh arms on it, little Play-Doh head, little Play-Doh legs. Make snakes. Somebody said that's why there's so many snakes in the world. God was going, boy, these are easy. <laughs> okay. 
But <laughs> that's bad. He gave us statutes. They're not to be changed. A, a snake. Snakes change. I was I was fishing Thursday, Wabash River, and had my had my chicken liver bait laying out there in the river. I was trying to catch catfish. And I'm sitting there, and I look down at the water, and there's a snake in that water. Not more than eight feet away from me. And I do not like snakes. Don't ask me what kind it was. I just told you it was a snake. That's all that anybody needs to know. And I, I reached for my gun. <laughs> I'm going to shoot that rascal, okay? Uh, it's funny, though. I'll give you this. What made me think of it was, when I stood up, that snake immediately saw me, curled back, dove down in the water. And it did that every single, it kept coming back toward me in the water. And every time I stood up, that thing took off. And I'm going, well, it works, doesn't it? Okay? But anyway, snakes twist and bend and... They don't maintain their form. That's something that God designed about serpents and snakes. They don't maintain their form. They're not fixed. And that, there's wisdom in that. Statutes and judgments are fixed. They keep their form. They keep their, their appearance. Everything about them. Everybody knows what it is. Okay? I may not be able to define exactly every aspect of what stealing is, but I know it when I see it. Amen? I know it when I see it. Because it's easily recognizable. Anyway, these gave us statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land whither you, you go over to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in horror out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves. Make you a graven image. There it is right there. The image comes out of the imagination of man. God said, you do not see me, therefore... You do not carve me. Do not make an image. I gave you statutes. You want to know what I look like? Read the statutes. You want to know how I am? Read the word. Read the judgments. Read the Bible. You want to know, if you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus in your Bible. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's not some big mystery anymore. If you want to know... Here it is, right here. God looks like this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So there's no mistake in that. So God said, take heed to yourselves. Lest you make your graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any... And by the way, there's male gods and female goddesses everywhere. In Jefferson County, Missouri, male gods, female goddesses. St. Agnes, St. Teresa, St. Mary. These are all goddesses. St. Thomas, St. Joseph, St. Paul, St. Peter. These are all gods that people pray to. They have statues erected in their honor, which you ought not do. Amen? Don't do it. And take heed to yourselves. The similitude of any likeness, male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth. The likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air. The likeness of any thing that creepeth on the ground. The likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. Unless thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars. Now we're told specifically in our Bibles that the sun, moon, and the stars are, are emblems of spirits, angels. The host of heaven. The stars are going to fall. One third of the stars of heaven are going to fall. Those are spirits. Those are angels. Um, all over. All over the world. They've worshipped the sun god. All over the world. Baal was the sun god. All over the world they've worshipped the moon goddess. Ashtaroth was a moon goddess. What is the emblem of Islam? Crescent moon. Star and moon. Okay. It's, it's a goddess-type worship. They don't acknowledge that, but that's what it is. Uh, the likeness of any beast, verse 17, any beast that is on the earth, any winged fowl that flieth in the air, 
The likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. Lest thou lift up thine eyes, and when thou seest the sun, the moon, and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them. Now see, the Bible is telling you what worship is. It is obeisance and servitude. To that astrology is star worship. Why? Because it says that whatever the stars tell me to do by their motions, by their alignments, what, whose house they're in, whatever the stars, the sun, the moon, all of the planets, whatever, whatever they tell me to do, that's what I do. That's what your horoscope is. If you're a Gemini, then you should not marry a Capricorn. I don't know if that's true. I made that up. I don't know. But that's what they tell you. Oh, you're a Gemini, and you're married to a Capricorn, and you guys are still married? <sighs> well, it won't be long, because Geminis and Capricorns, they don't get along very well. And, and let's see, what, what month were you born in? What day were you born in? Oh, well, in, that, in, your, in, in your sign there, there's things you can do in life, things you can't do in life. And people follow this stuff. They follow it. I don't want to get into, I mean, there's all, all kind, my mind's just racing all these different ways I can go this morning, but I'm not going to stick to the text. Should it be driven to worship them and serve them? Whatever the horoscope tells you to do, that's what you do. Which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. So God said, don't make these things. Turn to uh, Romans chapter 1 very quickly. Let's see how much time I got left. Boy, I'm going to buzz on out of here. Let's see here. Where can we go? Where can we go? Yeah, there we go. Romans chapter 1. Everybody, you hear people, you'll hear movies. You'll hear uh, commercial advertisements. You'll see it in marketing slogans. Everybody's telling you, follow your heart. Follow your heart. You just need to follow your own heart. Follow your own destiny. Don't trust that. You know why? Your heart is wicked. And it's deceitful. Worst kind of lie in the world is the lie that you told that you now believe. The lie that you told that you now, the one that you came up with, is the one that you believe. That is the worst kind of lie in the world. You're following your deceitful, wicked, disgusting heart. And it's going to lead you down the steps of hell. I promise you it will. All right? Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for his power of God into salvation. But then he talks about in verse uh, 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the image right there, made like the corruptible man, the birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. And I know I've t talked on all that, but I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of setting the theme here. All right. Now, uh, Isaiah 28. Turn there, Isaiah 28. I'm going to show you, I'm just going to kind of walk down the road here, and I'm going to show you what it looks like to cast down imaginations. What it looks like. God drew a picture for you in your Bible. So we're going to set that theme up, all right? Isaiah 28, I have it up on the screen, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast for precept must be upon precept precept upon precept line upon line line upon line here a little and there a little what is the Bible teaching you It's teaching you that if you want to know if you want to have biblical knowledge and you want to you want to be able to understand doctrine then it's going to come to you by way of this precept over here, and then this precept over here. God says, learn those two precepts. But I don't understand them. God said, learn them. Then, another precept, another precept. God said, learn them. Then he said, line upon line. Read this passage of scripture over here in the Old Testament. Read this passage of scripture over here in the New Testament. Well, I don't understand what they say. 
God said, read them. God said, get to know them. That's knowledge. That learning the facts. Then, hear a little and there a little. Okay? So, it's, it's, you pick up a little bit here. You pick up a little bit over here. And, and then all of a sudden now, God is the one who starts connecting these things together. And because you've, had, you've built up in your mind a database of knowledge, of biblical facts, facts that do not change. Did not David kill Goliath? Did he not? He killed Goliath, did he not? Sure he did. Did you know the new translations of the Bible have David, somebody else killing Goliath? Not David. Because there's a passage where the King James talks about one of David's mighty men killing the brother of Goliath. And the King James translators knew that it had to be the brother of Goliath because if not, it would have introduced a contradiction in the text. The new versions took that passage in Hebrew and said, they, they did not add the brother of Goliath, they took that part out so they have one of David's mighty men killing Goliath, the Gittite. Okay? You know what that is? It's Plato Bibles. For years, everybody believed David killed Goliath. Well, now we're going to introduce, maybe David didn't kill Goliath. So, well, that doesn't really affect anything. Oh, yes, it does. Because you're already establishing the Bible is Plato. And you can make it into whatever you want out of it. And then he says, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. And what I wanted you to notice about Isaiah 28 is, there's all this doubling taking place here. Precept, precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little, there little. Stammering lips and another tongue. Stammering lips are Moses. Another tongue is Greek, the New Testament. Alright? Now, 1 Corinthians 14, 21, I'm just kind of setting this up here. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that, and, for, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. So, the Old Testament and the New Testament combined together. All right? Now, turn to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Let's see if I have... Yeah, here we go. 1 Corinthians 14, 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. And it's very, very important here that I'm, I'm bringing this to bear. Your Bible was written, the Old Testament, primarily in Hebrew. There are passages in the Old Testament that were written in Aramaic. Aramaic is like a first cousin to Hebrew. You say, well, what's the difference? Um, who in here knows a little bit about Spanish? Yeah, I'm not saying you speak Spanish. I'm just saying you know a little bit about it. Okay? Who in here knows a little bit about French? Spanish, French, Portuguese, um, Italian. They're languages. They're called Romance languages. Now, that doesn't mean they're all full of kissy pies and you speak them so you can talk seductively to somebody. They're called romance languages because they all derive from Rome. They're all based upon Latin. Latin is the mother tongue of French, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, and maybe a couple others in there. Okay? But they're all very, very similar in how words are and how phrases are. But if you speak Italian, you cannot say that you can understand somebody who speaks Spanish. Because there are differences. Enough differences to, to make confusion. Alright? But if you know Italian, and you hear someone speaking Spanish, you're going, I, okay, I, kind of, I recognize some of that. I get that. Well, that's the similarity between Hebrew and Aramaic. They're sort of first cousins to one another. Alright? But still, they are separate, complete languages. Greek, even the alphabet of Greek, is based upon the Hebrew alphabet. If I say alpha, that's the first critical alphabet. Aleph is the first letter Hebrew alphabet. Daleth 
and delta are, sa are the same. Gimel and gamma are the same. So they're kind of related to each other, but they're different. Here's why I'm saying all this. Paul said, if any man speak an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. There is a prohibition in your Bible for me, as your pastor, to get up here and read to you Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek text and say, that's the Word of God right there. Everybody get saved and go home. I'm not allowed to do that. I'm a barbarian if I do that. Those, la those unknown languages to you must have an interpretation. Must they not? Okay? They must have one interpreting them. Um, look at... Matthew 18, 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Notice that it's the same concept, same principle, same number. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Two or three. Now watch this. Take your Bible, turn to 2 Kings 9. 2 Kings 9. I'm going to finish this, though the stars fall. Amen. 2 Kings 9. Hurry up. That bell's going to ring any second now. 2 Kings 9. Jezebel always represents Mystery Babylon the Great. She, she is the strange woman in the book of Proverbs. She represents confusion. Her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. So, I've mentioned this before. The Greek lexicons and the Hebrew lexicons, which are the dictionary of the Hebrew and Greek words, they are in a constant state of alteration and change. So that you cannot, if you say, well, I believe the Hebrew and Greek is inspired, and since, since I can't believe, uh, since I can't, I don't know Hebrew and Greek, I'll just go to the lexicons and they'll tell me what the word means. In which, by the way, I went to the Greek lexicon the other day and was looking at something and I found a mistake in the King James Bible. No, you didn't. You found a lexicon that lied to you. And that lexicon has, a, has additions to it and the one that you read is different than the one they come up with 40 or 50 years ago. They're constantly... The dictionary now is a big wad of Play-Doh. Let's make the words mean whatever we want it to mean. What does the word gay mean? What does it mean? Happy. It does not mean a sodomite. That's what we change it into. What does an affair mean? We cannot even use that word now. Back 100 years ago, they used to say, uh, we shall have an affair this afternoon. Which means that we're going to have a gathering together with an intended purpose. But now we've changed it into an, an adulterous situation. And what I'm telling you is, you cannot trust the lexicons, the Greek and Hebrew dictionaries, to give you the Word of God because they're constantly changing like a ball of Play-Doh. God gave you statutes. This Bible has not changed and will not change, bowed and will not bow down to the whims of and the imagination of man will not do it. Somebody say amen. That's who Jezebel is. That's what she represents. She hates the static word of God. She hated Elijah. You remember that? She said, I'll have Elijah killed. By the time it's all said and done, I'm going to have that man destroyed. I'm going to have that man killed. You know who Elijah was? He was the Bible back in those days. Her goal was to destroy the word of God. So now watch this. You're going to see it. When Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face. She tired her head. That means she put her makeup on, she fixed her, she attired her hair, she fixed it all up, and she looked out at a window. Come on, come on there, come on here, Jehu, come on, pretty boy. I'll lure you in like I've done everybody else. I'll conquer you and I'll destroy you. So verse 31, and as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, had Zimri peace, who slew his master, and lifted up his face to the window and said, who's on my side? Now Jehu is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. 
Why did not the Bible give you a definite? Was there two or three? The Bible's not being specific for a reason. Could, did God know how many there were? Could he have incorporated that into his word? Surely he could. But that's not what he's trying to teach. He's trying to get you to, to connect to something. Two or three. At the mouth of two or three witnesses. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or three. Okay? And those, and those be one interpretation. So two or three eunuchs. Now here's the deal with eunuchs. It doesn't matter. She could have painted that old barn and put a tire on her head all day long. And the eunuchs would not have said, oh, she's looking hot now. They're eunuchs. They don't get turned on by women. Amen? It does not bother them. So they said, we'll do it. Two or three. And they cast down imagination. Look at here. They th and he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. Some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And, trod and uh, he trod her underfoot. Jezebel is your wicked imagination that needs to be cast down by th these two or three eunuchs. Though they might have been separate, they came together for this one purpose. They acted as one man to pick Jezebel up and toss her out the window and have her destroyed. She was your imagination. The two or three eunuchs is your interpreted Bible. Interpreted means translated and interpreted by itself. The Bible interprets the Bible. You want to know what the Bible means in the book of Mark? Then read the rest of the Bible. It'll tell you what it means. These three right here acting as one will cast down the imaginations that are going on in your side of your heart. Do not give in to your mind or your heart saying, well, I don't believe God would be this way or I think God with me, God says it's okay for me to live how I'm living. Don't yield to that, people. That's Jezebel. That is her ways being not understood. They're so movable. Moving around, going from one to the other. And it takes the static word of God, the two or three witnesses right here, to cast her down. Now let me just say this to you, because I've been dealing with this personally. My heart, my mind, and my emotions sometimes say things to me that I don't like. Okay? And I, sometimes I, I'm, I really struggle with it. And I've learned over the years, when I've had about enough of that, I'll get my Bible out. And I'll let these, these boys here cast down those imaginations. I'll let my Bible tell me what's real and what's true. Some, I'll just tell you, sometimes with me, it is, Mike, you don't belong in the ministry. You're, you're not a good Christian. You probably don't even belong in church. Why don't you just leave? Why don't you just get out? Why don't you just move on? That runs through here. Okay? Now, if that ever comes from God, God's going to show it to me. But when I get my Bible out and I read it and I ask God, God, if that's my wicked heart, throw her out the window. Because I don't want anything to do with it. Okay? That's what I'm telling you to do. You cast down those imaginations because they will exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. Don't trust that stuff, people. Don't trust it. Okay? You pray for me this morning. I got a message. I'm, I'm, I don't know which way to go with it. I'm very, very burdened. Okay? Very burdened. So you guys pray for me, all right? Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings. We ask your grace, your help. Father, thank you for this book. Thank you for what it says. Thank you for what it is. Father, my life was a ship adrift. No course, just driven by the wind, driven by the waves. No steadiness. 
And when God, you established in my heart the two or three witnesses, the two or three eunuchs, the two or three unknown tongues being interpreted. God, when you established that in my heart, you anchored me. God, I thank you for that. Because I don't like being adrift. And Father, Lord, just, Lord, if it happens to me, God, I know, Father, that it happens to other people. And God, if you bring it my way, Lord, for the purpose of then how you comfort me, letting me comfort other people, Lord, then I'm fine with that. So, Father, I just pray, God, that you would make our lives a blessing for your kingdom and for others. And, Father, Lord, that you would just magnify and exalt your word, everything in our hearts and lives. Bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen.